Hey everyone, welcome back to Music Appreciation. Today we're continuing our discussion about popular music and uh, then we'll listen to some examples of early rock and roll. Um, so to recap on what we discussed for Monday's lecture, um, we tried to define what it means to be popular. And this is a broad term um, that is all-encompassing with many different genres and sub-styles, um, but most important for uh, our purposes is considering the scale of consumption, um, so who's buying the music and how are they accessing it, how is it being distributed, um, and how does it reflect social groups um, and kind of personal identity. Uh, so we also on Monday quickly mentioned the origins of the pop music industry. Uh, it all begins here uh, in Manhattan in an area called Tin Pan Alley, um, and this was a whole a group. You can see all these different music publishers all producing um, sheet music that you could take home and play on your piano and sing at home. Um, and that was the most common way of making music at this point. Um, after this, by the 1930s, we see um, radio technology becoming more widely available. Probably half of the U.S. households have a radio. And so distribution shifts from sheet music production in Manhattan um, to radio stations. Um, early on, there are very few radio station, national radio stations, and they're all mostly um, marketing their music to um, white uh, pop music fans, um, which we would kind of call the mainstream listeners here. Um, as technology develops with the radio, we start to see local, regional stations um, popping up, and they're playing music uh, of different styles and, and genres, local, regional genres. Um, R&B, jazz, ragtime, country, folk, all of this, um, and spreading musical tastes and experiences all throughout the country. Um, and eventually this kind of coalesces into an entirely new genre of music, uh, and this is called rock and roll, and the, the term rock and roll came uh, was coined by um, Alan Freed, who was a famous radio DJ, um, and he says it's a river of music that's absorbed many streams, but they all contribute to the big beat. So what exactly is rock and roll? Um, this genre, we're going to say, spans from about 1950 to the early 1960s. So it's maybe about a decade in length before we start to see shifts in the 1960s uh, when we start to hear uh, rock and roll coming from uh, Europe, like the Beatles and the British invasion. Um, and so after that we start to just call it rock in general. Um, but rock and roll itself is a combination of so many different unique genres and styles of music, of American music. Jazz, swing, ragtime, country, gospel, uh, all, all of these different styles that we've um, discussed so far in our discussions about uh, early 20th century music. Um, and early on, this was pioneered by a, a group of African American artists who were exploring all of these different styles. Um, and there is a standard instrumentation as well for this, usually a lead guitar, maybe a backup guitar, a bass, a drum kit, and then, of course, you've got your lead singer. So I want to look today at um, what I'm calling the first generation of rock and rollers. Um, and we're going to look at three major players here, Fats Domino, Chuck Berry, and Little Richard. There were, of course, many other rock and rollers at the time, um, but these three artists were probably the most um, influential and important to this style. Um, so one thing that I, one framework I'd like to explore these artists um, through is by considering him, them in comparison to um, cover versions. So uh, to cover, as you may already know, to cover a song is to perform a song that was written by somebody else. Uh, it's still something that's pretty common nowadays, um, and a lot of major artists and record labels have very stringent rules on how cover versions work, how you copyright that, how you compensate the original artist. Um, it's become a whole branch of law. Um, but in the early 1950s, there really wasn't a lot of infrastructure to, um, to kind of regulate this. Uh, nobody quite, you know, it was radio and the record industry was so new um, that there weren't really rules for it, and so in many ways it was kind of abused. Um, so it became common practice for record companies to cover rock and roll songs um, originally performed by black artists using white singers instead. Um, and of course, the 1950s, the United States is um, so racially divided and divisive 
um, that many people did not want to hear black artists on the radio. They didn't want to buy records by black artists, but record companies knew that this music was good and people liked it. Um, so they kind of tried to sanitize it in a way by um, having white singers cover these pieces. Um, two famous people who uh, were known for doing this quite a bit would be Frank Sinatra, who also wrote a lot of his own music as well, um, and especially and maybe most notoriously Pat Boone. So here he is right here. Um, so I want to play you music by each of these three artists, and then we can kind of compare them and contrast them um, with the Pat Boone covers. Um, so Fats Domino, he's a uh, kind of our pioneering rock and roller here. Um, he is, or was, the first artist to achieve crossover success. And that means that, um, because the, uh, when an artist is able to cross over from one uh, kind of style or genre an artist over into another one. So uh, the billboard, uh, you, this still exists today, I mentioned it in the first video, um, was the main standard for tracking sales um, of and uh, radio play for albums at this point in time. Um, and they were keeping two different uh, lists going. They had one for black artists and one for white artists. And they referred to those as um, race records versus the mainstream. And Fats Domino was the first person who was able to cross over to the mainstream um, list. So he was quite successful. He sold 5 million records by 1955, uh, which is even today a big deal. Um, but his music was also heavily covered by um, Pat Boone, as I mentioned. Um, and even though Fats Domino was quite successful, Pat Boone was even more successful um, covering these songs. Um, so Fats Domino, he's a, a little bit more kind of old-fashioned, if you will. He, uh, is, he plays piano and leads from the piano. Uh, which is something that kind of in the style of Duke Ellington and swing music. He also tends to use um, sort of like a big band in the background with lots of wind instruments, again recalling Duke Ellington and swing music. Um, but we've got a, a steady backbeat going um, in the drum kit. Uh, it's danceable um, and it's very much rock and roll. So um, what I'm going to ask you to do here is to, I suppose, pause the video and listen to Ain't That a Shame, one of his biggest hits, and then listen to Pat Boone's cover. So um, I've mentioned this playlist I've got going here, um, and since we're not using the textbook at this point in time, um, I'm going to ask you to refer back to this playlist. Uh, Hopefully you've already seen it, I don't know. Um, but this is where I've been keeping um, music for the entire semester, things that I reference that might be um, good supplemental material, things that I've played in these videos. Um, but I have added these in order here so it's easy to access. So Fats Domino, Ain't That a Shame, Pat Boone, Ain't That a Shame. Uh, and they're short videos, they're you know two minutes long, so it shouldn't take that long, that much time to listen to all of these. Um, but click through those, be thinking about what uh, makes this rock and roll, uh, how is Pat Boone's cover different, which one do you prefer and why, um, and making these comparisons about what they might say uh, about society in the 1950s. Um, so you can access this playlist through our Canvas website here, or excuse me, our Blackboard website. Um, so over here on the left-hand side where I've been putting all of our material for this semester, there's a link for a YouTube channel. And here you can find a link to the lecture videos um, and also this course playlist right here that I just showed you. All right. The next artist I would like you to explore um, through our class playlist here is Little Richard. Um, he was born in 1932 and is actually still alive, um, so he had a very long stretching career. Um, very popular up through the 90s especially, it was still performing. Um, you'll probably notice that Fats Domino has a very kind of reserved, polite, um, happy uh, sort of feel to it. It's um, 
very kind of easy listening music, nothing terribly offensive about it. Um, and Little Richard takes this a lot further. He's definitely still working in the rock and roll um, idiom, but he is known for his really outrageous live performances, his wild behavior, his crazy personal life. Um, and you can see even in this picture right here, he was famous for uh, not using a piano bench and instead he stands and he dances while he's playing. His signature move was to put his leg up on the piano like this um, and play through his legs while dancing kind of suggestively. Um, and so he was definitely a little bit more uh, scandalous for audiences in the 1950s. Um, his vocal style is also quite uh, unique. He has gospel roots um, growing up singing in the Baptist church. Um, and gospel music, gospel singing is so expressive and exuberant and emotional. Uh, it's loud, you can shout and make noises. Um, it's the opposite of a reserved, polite singer like um, Pat Boone. Um, so Little Richard, because he was a little bit more controversial, was not quite as commercially successful originally as Fats Domino, um, but he does, as I mentioned, have a very long career. Um, so next I'd like you to explore his famous song, Tutti Frutti. You've probably already heard it um, before, so I've included that right here. Uh, note the way that he's dancing, um, the way that he kind of looks at the camera suggestively. Um, he you know, is he eventually stand, moves away from the piano and starts dancing again. Um, be thinking about what the lyrics are saying. It's not an it's not an offensive song or anything like that, but he's definitely adding a little bit more edge than we got with Fats Domino. And then after that, I'd like you to explore um, Pat Boone's version of Tutti Frutti and be thinking about um, the difference in body language, uh, the singing style, the backup band, um, and also the location in which Pat Boone is performing this song. Okay, and finally I'd like to end with uh, some Chuck Berry. Um, he, both he and Fats Domino actually passed away just last year in 2017. Um, and Chuck Berry kind of starts to move in the direction of uh, what we think of today as being rock, meaning he uh, changes the instrumentation around. Uh, today it's not as common to have a rock star um, playing at the piano, instead you normally associate it with a guitar, the lead singer with a guitar. Um, so he uses the guitar as his main instrument. Um, this allows the artist to move away and get a lot more dance and movement in their performances because of course if you're playing the piano you're kind of stuck there because it's a big instrument but if you've got a guitar you can dance around the, uh, the stage and have all sorts of moves and interact with the audience um, so he definitely adds um, the sense of physicality to his performances he's especially famous for his duck walk which he's kind of doing right here where he gets down on one leg and hops around. And so he's kind of developing, developing this sort of rock star persona as well. Um, he also writes music about teen life specifically. So he talks about going on dates with girls and getting your first car and um, how old people listen to boring music and young people have fun music. Um, so he's definitely also moving in the direction that the record industry has wanted to go, which was to market to very specific audiences. Um, so for this last one, I'd ask you to listen to Roll Over Beethoven. And I've included that one right here. This is from a live performance in 1965, I believe. Um, and note, as I mentioned, the physicality, his dancing, his movement, um, the, his backup band as well, his interaction with the audience, um, and also the lyrics as well. So what does he mean by Roll Over Beethoven? Um, of course, he means it's time for classical music or music by old people for old people to roll over, to step aside, and to let the young people in, to let the rock and roll in. Um, so I hope you enjoy all of these pieces. Uh, for our assignment, I'll be asking you to compare and contrast them and discuss your reactions to them. Um, so do take a few minutes to listen through each of those videos. All right, thank you.